Hugh Latimer grew up in England during a very tumultuous time, especially in the life of the church. He was born the son of a poor farmer who owned no land and who, owned and who earned only a small annual wage. As such, as Latimer was growing up as a young boy, he both witnessed, he actually says his father did the work of six men. That's how hard his father worked. So he witnessed hard work and he also participated in hard work as a young man. But as the Lord directed his life, he was able to enter school and there showed much, much promise as a scholar. As was true of nearly everyone, if not everyone, in England at the time, Latimer was raised, he was born and he was raised within the Roman Catholic Church. As the Reformation began in the early 1500s and it began to make its way to England, Hugh Latimer, who was a gifted speaker and debater, argued strongly against Protestant theology and in favor of the papacy. As a student at Cambridge, he gained both respect and position in the student body. And within the school, he used his position and he used his standing amongst his fellow students to denounce very publicly to denounce the opinions of the Reformers and the Reformers themselves. On one such occasion, when he was adamantly arguing against one Reformer, there was a man, a fellow student of Latimer's, in the crowd, and his name was Bilney. Bilney had come to believe uh, the Gospel. He had come to believe in salvation by faith alone, through Christ alone, based on the authority of Scripture alone. And as he was in the crowd, and as he listened to Latimer argue against these sacred doctrines, he thought that, or he perceived in Latimer, that he was arguing these things based upon ignorance. And so he took a risk, and he decided to ask Latimer for a private audience following that speech, during which time he shared his testimony and shared with him the Gospel. God used Bilney's testimony to open Latimer's heart and mind to the Scriptures and to salvation in Christ. And he was changed over the course of that time. He was about 30 years old at the time. And over the course of those months, God changed his heart from being a leading critic of the Reformation to an adamant supporter of it. From the time of his conversion to the end of his life, there were times of favor upon the Protestant church. And there were also times of severe persecution. And all of that depended upon who sat on the throne of England. During Henry's reign, uh, there was ups and downs for the Protestant church. That's Henry VIII. During Philip's reign, or I'm, I apologize, during Edward's reign, Edward VI, times were quite good for the church. And in fact, Latimer rose to the position of bishop within the Church of England. And he used that opportunity as bishop within the church to make the most of promoting the Scriptures and promoting the Gospel. But troubled times were yet to come as Mary took the throne. And Latimer, along with several of his co-workers in the Gospel, were confined to a small cell. They were put in prison. After a time in prison where they were tried, where many tried to convince them to renounce their doctrines, to renounce their faith, uh, and they refused to do so, after a time it was determined that they would be put to death for their convictions regarding Scripture and salvation. And so it was that along with Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer was brought out of the dungeon to be executed on October 16th, 1555. The executioners fastened a small bag of gunpowder around each man's neck. And then as they were brought to the post, they were chained back to back with a metal chain around their waist. And uh, Latimer is said to the executioner, he says, make sure it's nailed in there well, because the flesh will have its way. 
as the fire was brought to the wood that had been piled around the stake and as the flames began to spread amongst the kindling that was at their feet, this is what Latimer says to Ridley. He says this, Be of good comfort, Brother Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust never shall be put out. And as the flames rose, both men cried out to the Lord to receive their souls. For many years after that awful day, Latimer and Ridley's courageous testimony did have an enormous impact on the Reformation movement in London and in England. When I think of men and women like Hugh Latimer, who were faithful to Christ to the very end, I think to myself, these are extraordinary men and women. They're just extraordinary. While I think it's certainly true that they are extraordinary people, it is also true that the ability to have a faithful witness, a faithful testimony for the Gospel of Jesus Christ is the work of God's grace. In fact, I would say Latimer and Ridley and Cramner and Bradford and all those reformers who died, they're not the heroes of the story. God is. It's the grace of God at work in their lives. And the same work that is so clearly evident in the lives of people like Hugh Latimer is present in every single believer. The very same pattern that we see in the life of Hugh Latimer, of this martyr for Christ, is present in every follower of Jesus Christ. I know that not all of us go to the stake. I know that that's the case. But there is a pattern that we see in his life that all of us follow who are followers of Jesus. That's the subject of our text this morning, so turn with me in your Bibles if you would. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Here the Apostle Paul tells us about the change that takes place in the lives of people who truly believe the good news of the Gospel. The first thing the Apostle does here is he shows the necessity of the change. The Lord reminds us here that all people before coming to Christ by faith are opposed to God. This is a difficult lesson for us to accept, but that's the lesson of verse 21, that all people begin as enemies of God. You doubt that? Listen to the words of Psalm 51, verse 5, where it says, Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Right out of the gate, the psalmist says. Right from the beginning, he's a sinner opposed to God. All people begin as enemies of God. Listen as the past of these believers is described here in verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds, because of your evil behavior. The condition of unbelievers that's described here, that's what he's talking about. You guys are, he's, he's talking to them as followers of Christ, but then he says, once, a day in the past, you were alienated from God. It's a, it's, he's describing a state of constant being here. It comes through in the original language. When it says, once you were, it's saying more than you were just like this once in a while. Like, You know, in the past, before you knew Christ, you had some good days where you loved the Lord and you served the Lord, and then you had some bad days where you hated the Lord and you were His enemies. No, it's much more serious than that. What he's saying is every second of every moment of your life before knowing Christ, you were alienated from God. Being alienated is the idea of being separated from someone It's the idea of being incapable of having a good relationship with another person. It's like 
living across the ocean from another country before boats and airplanes were invented to get us from place to place. People living on one side of the world back in those times were completely separated from people on the other. Not only did they have the barrier of language and custom and culture, they weren't even aware of the other person's culture and custom and language because of the distance that separated between them. And that made a relationship between them impossible. Nation could not know another nation living across the ocean. That's what it's like with God apart from Christ. Except there's a much greater distance between us and God than there, than there is between nations separated by an ocean. And there's a much bigger barrier between us and God than simple language and culture. The problem is more than mere separation here. Look at, it says it right here. In this verse, on top of being strangers, on top of being alienated from God as a constant state of being, look at what it says in the middle of verse 21. It says, and not only are you strangers, not only are you separated, and you were enemies of God in your minds. People separated by an ocean may not know even of each other's existence, but God has made Himself known to all of humanity. It's what we're told in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that God has made who He is known to everybody on the face of the planet through what has been made. God doesn't just make Himself known through His Word. We need to be thankful that He does because we wouldn't know Him otherwise. He doesn't just make Himself known through His Son. We need to be thankful that He does because we wouldn't know Him otherwise. But He makes Himself known through what has been made. But what do people do with that information? As we look at the glories of creation, what do we do? Do we worship God rightly? Do we know Him and love Him? No. Instead of knowing Him and instead of loving Him, every single person rejects Him. And not only do they reject God, but they harbor hostility towards Him. You say, well, why is that? Because basic to the mind of human beings separated from God is a desire to pursue evil. That's what it says here. Look at it. You were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Sinful human beings are bent on the pursuit of evil and that naturally makes us God's enemy. This is where the vast majority of people in our day stumble in regards to the human condition. Most people today think of themselves as good. And even when people do things that are wrong, that they know are wrong, I would say to you, I could ask you the question this morning, how many of you know it's wrong to lie? And all of you would put up your hands. Those of you who didn't have real problems. <laughs> no, you would all put up your hands. And then I could ask the question, how many of you have lied? Every single one of you should put up your hand. And I would too. I'm, I'm no better than you. But oh, how amazing we are at explaining away and rationalizing the wrong that we do. I get angry. I get upset. There's a good reason for that. I'm allowed to because of whatever reason I fill in the blank. I lose patience with my children. That's okay. I'm allowed to do that because they're so depraved. That's, I shouldn't say that about my children from the pulpit. I, got, I have to stop saying that. It's true, but I have to stop saying it from the pulpit. We're so good at justifying what we do. Evil, though, cannot be justified before God. There's no excuse when we, that we can offer for doing wrong before a holy God. And God hates it all. Whether it's a tiny lie, whether it's sexual immorality of some kind, whether it's stealing, whether it's idolatry, 
God hates it all. And our condition as human beings is far worse than simply the overtly evil things we do. It's also the good things that we attempt to do. Because even the most morally good action that is done independently of God That is the definition of unbelief. That is the definition of being an unbeliever is you're rejecting God. Even your most morally good action in that state becomes an action of evil. Because you're insulting the infinite glories of your Creator. It's a rather bleak condition that we have as human beings. We are enemies of God. Many years ago, there was something called the Cold War between the Russians and the Americans. Anybody remember the Cold War? During those years, it went on, I, I can't remember for how many years it went on, but it went on for a long time. And during those years, everyone was worried about a nuclear war, right? Because The Russians had enough nuclear weapons and the Americans had enough nuclear weapons to wipe each other off the face of the earth. And most people think that uh, there's enough nuclear weapons to wipe us all off the face of the earth. And everybody was kind of worried about uh, the Americans and the Russians launching their nuclear weapons at each other. But no one ever did. And I think the reason why no one ever did is because everybody knew if we launch ours, they're going to launch theirs and we're all done. But I often wonder how the Cold War would have played out if one side knew with absolute certainty that the other side would not have an opportunity to launch their missiles. I I kinda think, I, I kinda have the impression that if one side knew for sure that the other side wouldn't launch, somebody would press the button. Of course, we know that humanity has no power over God whatsoever. No human being has the power to affect God in His being whatsoever. But the human heart is such that if a button existed where we were able to take God out of existence, even though it would mean our own destruction, if we were able to take God out of existence, somebody, all of us, apart from Christ, would press the button. We're enemies of God. Now you say, uh, that, that raises an important question for me at least. What is God supposed to do with that? What's He supposed to do with that? When He gives us life, when He provides for our needs, when He shows us His glory, and we harbor hatred for Him in our hearts because of our desire for evil. What's He supposed to do with that? Well, it's impossible for Him to allow our rebellion and our hatred for Him to continue indefinitely. He can't do that. Because if God were to do that, He would be rejecting the goodness of His own nature. He would have to say that it's okay for people to commit acts of evil. Since it's impossible for God to deny His nature, He can't do that. Which means that He must stand and fight against His enemies and deal justly with every act of evil. And if we could wrap our minds around just what Paul says here in the first chapter of Colossians about the glory of God, then all of us would realize that when God takes the battlefield against His enemies, all of His enemies fall. All of them. There will not be a single person in hell who wants to be there. And don't don't think that hell is going to be filled with people who are sorry for their sin and their evil, longing to repent from their evil and wishing that God would forgive them and let them out of hell. That's not what hell is. Hell is going to be filled with people who are in constant hatred towards God for His just punishment 
of their evil. There's not a single person in hell who desires to repent. All they want is the destruction of God. That's all they've ever wanted since the moment they've started. Because they're God's enemies. Not a single person in hell will want to be here, but mark these words, not a single person in hell has the power to escape. Being God's enemies leads to eternal destruction. And according to this text, that is the way we all start out. This is what you were, Paul says, alienated from God. We begin as God's enemies and we are all objects of His wrath. That's an extremely bleak picture that clearly shows us that if there's to be any hope at all, then something has got to change. Something has got to change. Everyone begins as God's enemies, but is there a way to change it? And the Bible's answer, of course, is yes, there is. And that's what we have here in verse 22. The Apostle explains here what God has done in His Son to change the hearts of people. He shows us here that through Christ alone, people are restored to God's favor. No human being can do a thing to earn his or her way into God's grace. And God has only made provision for reconciliation. He's only made provision for restoration in His Son, Jesus Christ. Through Christ alone, people are restored to God's favor. Verse 22 describes what we were, or sorry, verse 21 describes what we were before turning to Christ. And then we read this in verse 22 the glorious words, but now. This is what you were, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. This is what you were, but now this is what God has done for you in Christ. He has, number one, He has reconciled you. That's a tremendous word in the original language. It means to be transferred from one state to another. You were God's enemies, but now He has brought you over to His side. He has made you a part of His family and He has given you friendship. The word also conveys the meaning of restoration and favor. You were the objects of God's wrath as His enemies, but now you are the objects of His kindness and of His love. Being reconciled means that there's a complete change in our relationship with God. Before, we were at war with God, but now we belong to Him as citizens of heaven. How does such a change take place. We're told here that we're reconciled by Christ's physical body through death. Remember, I said a few moments ago that God cannot ignore evil. For Him to do so would be to deny His own nature, which is impossible for Him to do. The consequences of our evil must be paid. And that's what Jesus does on the cross on our behalf. Paul is very specific here Mentioning Christ's physical body. Do you see that in the middle of verse 22? Now you've been reconciled through Christ's physical body. He does that to emphasize Jesus' humanity. In order for this great exchange to take place, in order for this change from being God's enemy to being God's friend to to take place, Jesus had to be like us. He had to be like us in every way except for our sinful condition. To lift the curse from humanity, Jesus took on humanity, and in His humanity, He experienced death in order to defeat death, which is clearly demonstrated in His physical resurrection. People talk these days about Jesus being raised from the dead spiritually. People talk these days about Jesus never having existed at all, and that Christianity is just a spiritual reality. It doesn't work doesn't work. Our salvation completely depends on Jesus being a historical 
person who is essential to our salvation, who really lived and who really died and who really rose again. And through Christ's death, we're told here that believers are able to stand before God as holy. See what it says? Through His death to present you holy in His sight. That means believers belong to God. This is what holiness means, is that believers belong to God and serve the purposes of God. So a believer then in Christ is changed completely from once being God's enemy, working against God, to being God's servant, to being set apart for the purposes of God. Who knows that better than the Apostle Paul? Who worked so hard to stop the name of Jesus going forth. Who celebrated at Stephen's death. You could talk about others like Latimer who in the first part of his life as he was an enemy of God argued against salvation. Argued against Scripture. And then he was changed to be a servant of God. And there are a whole host of examples through church history that are like that. In fact, every single Christian is like that. We all start out as God's enemies and through Christ we're changed, set apart for God to serve His purposes. Further, we're told here that believers are presented before God not only as holy, but without blemish in the sight of God. That is, every stain of evil has been washed clean from us By the blood of Jesus. Finally, it says that we are free from accusation. Apart from Christ, there is a long list of legitimate charges that can be brought against every single one of us. But in Christ, no one, no one can bring anything against you that can remove God's affection from you. No one can say, that we are unworthy to be in the presence of a perfect and holy God because when we turn to Christ, Christ covers us by His worth. It's hard to even begin to appreciate how radical the change that is being described here is. Perhaps some of you will be familiar with something called an LED. Have you heard that term before? LED stands for light emitting diode. They're all over the place now. You can uh, buy LED lights to save energy at home. There's LED LED TVs and screens. There's all kinds of LED LED stuff. And what a diode is, it's, it's, it's it's an electronic device that only allows current to flow in one direction. So in a simple circuit that you connect to a battery, if you connected a battery to some wires and you put the diode in one way, nothing would happen. It would just be darkness. But if you take the diode out and you flip it around and you put it back in the circuit, all of a sudden it lights up. Apart from Jesus, we're like an LED that's fighting against God and only there's only darkness in our life in Christ though everything changes it's like a dark LED that's turned around in the circuit and then the LED begins to give off light in our case we give off the light of the gospel the light of God's glory as the spirit transforms us from day Today, the moment God changes a person's heart and they believe the gospel, they go from being God's enemy under his eternal wrath to the object of his eternal kindness and mercy. I cannot put into words how drastic that change is. Only Jesus can bring about such a change in our relationship with God. This is a change that we all need. Our eternity, my eternity, your eternity depends on this change taking place. Given the great importance of the work of Christ on our behalf and placing our faith in that, the Apostle wants us to know whether or not that change has truly taken place or not. And that's what he points to here 
in verse 23. He shows us a critical aspect about the faith of a person who's changed by the power of the Gospel. Here it is. Heart-changing faith always endures. In the conflict between God and humanity, there is a clear and distinct line that defines which side people are on. There's no middle ground. There's no sitting on the fence. You're either for God or you're against God. And anyone who crosses that line from being God's enemy to being God's friend through faith in Christ never goes back to the other side. Never. Heart-changing faith always endures. Listen. Here it is in verse 23. He just finished talking about all the things that are done for us through faith in Christ. And then verse 23, if all these things that are true in verse 22 are yours, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the Gospel. This is the Gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. In order for the glorious work of Christ to be applied to your life, you need to, it says here, you need to continue in your faith by using the words established and firm here, he's given us a picture of immovable faith. One commentator describes this, uh, these words as firm and immovable. He describes them as a, a picture of someone riding a horse, well secured on their saddle. You know, sometimes the Christian life is like a nice, easy trot through a peaceful meadow, and it's easy to hold on. It's easy to continue in your faith. Other times, the Christian life can be like riding through really tough terrain or riding on a horse that is trying to get you off and it feels like you're barely hanging on. As I was thinking about that image of a rider being securely fixed upon a horse, I was thinking about our trip as a family earlier this summer to the Sun Parlor Rodeo. Did anybody else go to the Sun Parlor Rodeo? A couple people did um, and near the end of the evening that we were there, they had bull riding. Now, Darren Manley's not here this morning. Uh, he used to ride bulls. I don't know how anybody in their right mind does it. <laughs> that just does not seem like a smart thing to do to me, uh, to ride a bull. But they do it in the rodeo. Now, I, I know it's more complicated than this, but to the casual observer, as I look on and watch the people riding the bulls, what it looks like to me is there's a guy sitting on a bull and he's just trying to hang on for dear life. That's it. I know there's technique and all that stuff, but to me, it looks like they're just trying to hang on. Now, if you know about bull riding, then you know that the goal of riding the bull is to ride the bull for eight seconds. Do I have that right? Eight seconds. Do you know what you get if you don't hang on for eight seconds? Who knows? What do you get? Nothing! That hardly seems fair. <laughs> to go through all that and get nothing. That's what happens. If you don't hold on for eight seconds, what you get is nothing. That's the same with the Gospel. It does you no good to accept the Gospel and then walk away from Christ. You're not saved if you do that. You're not saved. Notice how Paul describes the Gospel here, he says that it's something that believers have heard with their ears. We're told earlier in the chapter that Epaphras was the one who came and preached the Gospel to them. 
when he preached the gospel, they heard the message and they believed it. He also says here in verse 23 that the gospel is something that is proclaimed. In fact, he says it's proclaimed to every creature under heaven. That is Paul's absolute confidence in the sovereignty of God that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. He talks about something in the future like it's already happened in the past because God is so certain. He is so determined to cause it to happen. It's a message that's proclaimed. It's a message that says that we're all wretched sinners. We got that in verse 21 and that we're under God's just condemnation. It's a message that says that Jesus died to pay the debt of our sin and to bring us out from under God's wrath into His favor. We got that in verse 22. It's a message that says that Jesus has been raised from the dead and will give all those who believe in Him the gift of eternal life. At the time that Paul first wrote these words, as he had been preaching the Gospel for a number of years and he had traveled through much of the Mediterranean world proclaiming Christ to be Lord, as he writes this letter, there are many people from outside the church and within the church that are trying to draw people away from trusting in Christ for their salvation. They're trying to draw people away from biblical truth and doctrine. And Paul's exhortation here is don't be deceived. Don't be drawn away because to do so will result in your eternal destruction. Being a Christian for five minutes does you no good. Being a Christian for only 50 years does you no good. If you're going to be saved, then you're a Christian for eternity. You never go back across that line. Some people might hear this language and ask, Can I have any assurance of being saved? I mean, it kind of sounds like this whole thing is iffy. It's all up in the air. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it to the end. Can I be sure? The answer to that question is, absolutely, you can be sure. The purpose of Paul emphasizing perseverance here, of, of hanging on, of staying with your faith, is not to put a big weight of fear and anxiety upon our backs. That's not the purpose of what is written here, but rather the purpose here is to show us the way in which we gain assurance. The only way that what Paul says here will be a means to well up fear and anxiety in our hearts is if our faith in the Gospel, if our faith in Christ depended upon us. If our faith in Christ depended upon us, upon our own will, upon our own strength, then we would have great reason to have great anxiety and fear and concern. But it doesn't depend on us. It's the gift of God's grace. It depends on Him. And the longer the Lord, the longer God causes us to endure in our faith as the Spirit does His work, changing our hearts, giving us a deeper and a richer relationship with Christ, as those years go by and as we grow up in Him, our assurance grows. Our confidence and our faith grows. If life, if you feel like life at the moment is like a big angry bull and you're asking yourself the question, how in the world can I hold on? Remember this. Remember this. Your faith does not depend upon you holding on. But it depends upon God holding you. Who learns, who grows, and who benefits from genuine faith enduring? Does God? No. God knows those who belong to Him. God is not worried in the least about bringing every one of His people into the glories and riches of eternity with Him. God's not worried about that at all. He knows who belongs to Him. He knows whom He is saving. Who then benefits from our perseverance in our faith? It's us. We're the ones that benefit. 
A person who genuinely believes and dies a week later is saved all the same. Saved just the same as somebody who's walked with Christ for 50 years and dies in the flames as a martyr. They're both saved. They're both saved. What's the difference? The one who's walked through fiery trials gains the great gift of assurance as they face eternity. A person who's been saved for a week and then is about to die may have some fear and anxiety at their deathbed. They're still saved. They're still in glory. We're not saved by works or how long we've been with Jesus. We're saved by the preciousness of His blood. But oh, the person who's walked with Christ for a long time, who's seen His faithfulness again and again, who's seen the work of the Holy Spirit grow in their heart, oh, they can go into eternity with assurance. Who benefits? from God putting, from Paul writing this condition upon our faith. Who benefits? We do. Because the longer that we walk with the Lord, the more certain we are that we are His. And that we belong to Him. Don't worry. Don't worry about meeting a fate like Hugh Latimer. Concern yourself rather, dear brother, Dear sister, with trusting in the faithfulness of God, and He'll see you through. Don't don't be arrogant or boastful about your ability to stand firm in trial. Simply acknowledge your weakness and believe in God's promises that He will keep you through it all. Have you been changed by the gospel? You need to be. Otherwise, you're an enemy of God under His wrath. Why continue as God's enemy? Why fight against Him when He gives you the opportunity to be His friend? When He gives you the opportunity to know His grace and His mercy through His precious Son? Why persist in being His enemy? Don't do it! Come to Christ. Trust Him today, tomorrow, and for all eternity. And if you do that, then you'll know the hope of the Gospel. The Gospel that changes lives. Let's pray. God, again, I confess to You that this text is filled with riches and glory and beauty. And we need You to see it. Oh God, I pray that You would grant us greater vision. I pray that You would grant us minds of greater understanding. I pray that You would grant us hearts that know the certainty of Your love and Your faithfulness. God, I thank You for the joys and the riches of the Gospel. And I pray that they would be changing us as Your people day by day. For Christ's sake, for Your glory, and for our good and joy, I pray these things. Amen.